Okay, welcome to the uh, premiere episode of Film Fanatics. My name is Dan. My name is Justin. I am Joe. And uh, we love movies. Basically, we're going to do a a weekly podcast called Film Fanatics, as you just heard. And we're going to have a few different segments. Uh, We all sort of have different uh, and sometimes conflicting views, which I think will make it interesting. This is true. Essentially, uh, not specifically this episode, but in future episodes, we're going to have sort of a breakdown of three films that we watched that week. The first is going to be... Uh, on Sunday, which we've dubbed New Classic Sunday, movies that have come out within the last two years that Justin and I have both given uh, B grades to or higher. Joe has seen some, has not seen some. Um, And then Tuesday, we're all going to sort of rotate picking a film, uh, and that's going to be an older film that we've seen and enjoyed and want to introduce the group to. And then the one I think that will be the most interesting is the thursday oscar nominee category um we're going alphabetically through every oscar nominated movie in the main like eight or nine categories all the acting categories best picture best director the screenplays all that kind of stuff Um, and we're going alphabetically so everything from the 1930s on is a fair game as long as it's out on dvd we're also going to do uh our top tens which are going to be fun. And this week, to uh, get everybody sort of acquainted to who we are, Joe, do you want to tell us what our top tens are going to be? Uh, we have a wide variety of top tens we're going to be doing, but I believe the first top ten list that we have for tonight is actually going to be the top ten films which we kind of related to our lives based upon personal experiences. So that's going to be our first top ten, which is kind of a unique choice. But we've got a lot of top tens we're going to go through from different categories. Yeah, a different category every week. And I, th- I think that'll be interesting. And uh, also, uh, since we are film fans, new and old, um, at the top of each show, we're going to discuss the movies we saw in theaters over the past week and uh, what our grades were. We have a pretty basic uh, lettering grade system. Joe and I go from uh, A plus through F. <laughs> uh, Justin does not do the A plus. Justin. It, <laughs> what do you what do you have for yours? I go all the way up to A, but I do include a D minus. Yeah, which, which Joe and I do not include. Which is sort of the last ditch effort before <laughs> F. I'm iffy about the D minus thing, but as long as it's within the basic grade, I think we can have a fair assessment of what we think. Yeah, yeah, I think it's pretty general. Um, so that's that's what the podcast is going to be about. Again, we're going to um, do it every week, um, and. Let's get the ball rolling here. Let's start it off with uh, some of the movies that we've seen in theaters. Um, this episode is uh, being recorded on August the 21st, so uh, we're talking about mid-August releases, late summer, um, and the first one uh, I saw in last week was uh, We're the Millers. Um, now, Joe, you saw that, yes? That's correct. I think we've all we've all seen that. That's correct, yeah. 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 Um, okay, well, for me, um, it was one of the funniest movies of the year. I thought it was uh, better than The Heat. I thought it was better than Identity Thief. Um, and I'm sure there were other comedies this year that Melissa McCarthy wasn't in. <laughs> um, but it was, definitely, uh, it was definitely up there for me. I, I'm a Jennifer Aniston fan. I'm a Sudeikis fan. I thought he was funny on SNL. I thought he was funny in Horrible Bosses. Um, for me, it all came together. I gave it a B plus. Joe? Uh, I agree with you for the most part. I actually personally liked The Heat more, but uh, I gave it a C plus rating. I thought it kind of hit the mark on most points. It was pretty funny, but there were some parts I felt kind of were a bit flimsy and awkward, but overall an enjoyable film. Okay. Justin, what did you think? I think it took a little while to get going. It was kind of scattershot on its humor. However, when it worked, it really worked, and it was really something to respect. Uh, for me, it was a B minus. There's a lot to like, but there's also a lot to, to have troubles with. So you guys are about on the same page with that. Roughly. I liked it a little bit more. Justin was a little more generous. Yeah, which is surprising. Justin uh, is is a little bit harsher, I feel, on comedy sometimes. Perhaps. It, it depends, really. But it does depend. All right, so the, the second movie I saw was uh, Elysium. <laughs> which we also all saw, and Joe, in fact, does a, a YouTube uh, review show, and uh, we'll plug that at the end of the program, but he did uh, a full 
review of Elysium that uh, you can check out. Um, I thought it was very good. Now, um, this is from the same director that did District 9, which, honestly, I was a little underwhelmed with. I know you guys both uh, enjoyed it a lot. Um, I think I gave that one a, a B, um, if I remember correctly. I thought this was really well done. Certainly well acted. You know, I'm a big Matt Damon fan. Jodie Foster, what can be said about her, but that she's a great actress. Um, and, and, my, I, and my love, of course. She, yeah, she is one of your loves, that is true. Um, and I think she also chooses projects wisely, and that's why you don't see her, you know, several times a year or even every year. Um, you know, sometimes she's hit or miss like everybody. The beaver was, uh, does not need to be <laughs> We don't talk about the beaver. Oh, the beaver. The beaver does not need to be mentioned. But I thought she was great in this. You know, it's funny. She didn't have uh, a, a extremely huge role. I thought maybe she would be in it more. Mm-hmm. Um, but she she's up in Elysium, and Matt Damon is on Earth, and most of the movie takes place on Earth. So um, that explains that. But I, I really liked it. I thought plot-wise it was solid. The action was good. Um, whoever the casting director was found the spitting image of Matt Damon as a kid. Did you guys think the same? Yeah, actually. It was it was pretty close. <laughs> I mean, that kid was like definitely Matt Damon to the T. Um, but overall, I gave Elysium an A-. Oh. Joe. Uh, I actually agree with pretty much everything Dan said. I thought it was fantastic. Um, I actually like District 9 more because I thought it was more experimental. It was more different, which I thought was interesting for a, a first director. But on the whole, I felt Elysium was a lot more solid and enjoyable. I thought it was one of Matt Damon's best performances. Uh, it was a great action film. It was very fluid. I also gave it an A-. minus. Nice. Very good. Justin, what did you think? I think for a sophomore attempt from the director, it was, it was pretty good. Like Joe, I, I did not like... As much as I like District 9, which was, as he said, more experimental, much more raw, but he still has that feeling of he's not every typical director, even when he's trying to be a bit more mainstream like he was with Elysium. I think it goes off in a couple strange directions. I think that some of the political subtle meanings to it are a little iffy. I kind of take a neutral stance on it. But overall, much like them, I was relatively satisfied with it. I thought it was one of the better movies it says come out this summer. I give it a B. Wow. So wow. good good reviews all around for Elysium. Uh, did anybody think of Wally when they were watching it? A little bit. Just on the, on the basic premise. Well, now that he brings it up, it, I do see it. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Um, all right. So the next film, uh, Joe, I don't think you saw. I went to see it uh, simply because I try and see uh, everything that gets a wide release. Um, we're talking about the sequel to Smurfs. Smurfs 2. <laughs> um, Justin actually saw that as well. Unfortunately, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> um, I'm happy to say that I did not join these gentlemen in uh, viewing Smurfs 2. Um, I thought it was all right. Um, I, I know Justin um, was was really kind of picking on it. Justin, why don't we hear from you first, actually? <laughs> oh, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> Oh boy, where do I start with this? Um, well, first of all, I'd like to say I have not seen part one in its entirety. I'm semi grateful for that. I really was not a big fan of this. I think the director is pretty much a throwaway. I felt it was, it honestly meant well, but there's only so much you can do with a Smurfs movie. I'm sorry. And it was just annoying. It was forced, it dragged aimlessly. I cannot believe that anybody thought this would actually work. And, I mean, animation-wise, it's okay. There are maybe, like, one or two mildly amusing moments. I won't say they're funny. I really won't say they're funny. I'm just going to leave it with a D. <laughs> oh, wow. Um, I gave it a C-. minus. We'll start there. Um, and let me tell you why. It was not as good as the first one. The first one is certainly nothing to write home about. Mm-hmm. I think I gave that a straight C. Um, I thought the themes in the movie were pretty good. Um, you know, a lot of times when you're talking about a movie that really is strictly for kids, and you're right that there isn't a whole lot to write home about, certainly for adults. Even really adults that grew up on the Smurfs, I think um, 
it's almost a slap in the face of the legacy, honestly, because Smurfs was a very, very popular cartoon when I was growing up. And um, I, I, you're right that, that they sort of missed the mark on that angle. But I do like the themes. There were some good, um, you know, parent-child themes in it, specifically with Neil Patrick Harris's uh, stepfather and Smurfette not being a true Smurf because she was created in Gargamel's lab, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, <laughs> it's not really worth going into the intricacies of the Smurfs, too. But I thought the themes for kids, you know, w- were positive. I thought they were done well and honestly not too schmaltzy. Um, a little bit, but I think that's to be expected. Um, Hank Azaria as Gargamel was uh, was great, just as he was in the first one. I'm a huge uh, Hank Azaria fan, obviously his work on The Simpsons. It was not great, you're right, it was not very funny, and it wasn't even that cute, really. <laughs> but uh, I think it was solid enough to, uh, you know, give it a C-. minus. All right, moving on from that is uh, another kid's movie. Joe, I hate to leave you out again. I apologize. It's okay, Dan. Um, but you don't need to see this because it was awful. That's what I heard. Um, and Justin and I, I think, are in full agreement on this. Um, I took my 8-year-old nephew to this. And to be fair, he really, really enjoyed it. Um, of the, the four animated movies we've seen this year, he said this was his favorite. Mm. For me, by leaps and bounds, it was the worst. Um, the movie is <laughs> the movie is Disney's Planes, um, which, if you don't know, was supposed to go directly to DVD, um, and that certainly shows throughout the film. But Disney decided, hey, let's make a buck and release it to theaters uh, in August when there's not a whole lot of uh, movies out for kids, and seems to be paying off a little bit. It's doing okay at the box office. Um, And like I said, my eight-year-old nephew loved it. I thought it was unfunny, unoriginal. You know, it's from the world of cars. You see some cars in it, but nobody from the actual Cars movies, um, except for a couple of really, really ancillary characters. Um, They tried to play off of the thing in Cars 1 with Paul Newman as the old has been race car you know this one was a an old world war one plane and it just for me nothing really hit about this movie the couple of things i will say about it i got a couple of really minor chuckles you know scenery wise it was good some of the sequences and that's sort of what kept it from an f but it was not good justin i have to agree with most of what uh, dan just gave to you it basically follows Pixar's complete playbook with Cars, and it really painfully shows. Dane Cook does nothing as a lead, as in almost 95% of every movie he's ever been in. The rest of the acting is either hollow or forced, and neither one really works. To play devil's advocate, though, I still found it more entertaining than their than Pixar's appalling effort with Cars 2. So... I left it at a D on that alone. Otherwise, it would have been a really easy F. Did you give Cars 2 an F? I gave Cars a D. Okay. So, same grade, though, as Cars 2. Same grade, but for very, very different reasons. Okay. Um, I I also gave Cars 2 a D, um, and it is pretty much, you know, for me, similar reasons. I mean, Planes did have its shorter running time going for it. Cars 2 seemed to just go on and on. All right, we, we got to move on from that train wreck yes. to another train wreck that was just released this weekend and will probably be gone from theaters by the time you hear this. Um, it is Paranoia, which is uh, Harrison Ford and Liam Hemsworth, and it is a thriller. And I'm explaining this because I don't think it got a whole lot of marketing promotion, so you may not even know what I'm talking about. Um, but Justin and I went to the uh, premiere of this, on Thursday night. I liked it slightly more. I believe uh, Justin should probably speak first on this. All right, well, let me start off by saying I thought this was just a complete mess. It had some interesting ideas. It could have worked well in the right hands of somebody like Ridley Scott or David Fincher, who would have played into how we pretty much are obsessing over our own technologies, but it's a subject matter that's been explored over and over and over again, and you've seen it done better. 
and Liam Hemsworth as the main as a leading man just cannot sell it and he's nowhere near as the good as the villains played by Harrison Ford and the incredibly talented Gary Oldman who does not show even a fifth of his talent in this it's just not good and I'm personally very thankful that it's bombing so nobody has to remember this for too terribly long but uh, Dan I'll let you finish this one off um, what, what was your grade on that one? Paranoia was a D. Okay. I'm not going to show you. Oh, I thought you gave that an F. No, no. I mean, like I said, the concept in the right hands might have been okay, but everything else just fails pretty much right across the board. Okay, fair enough. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think for me, one of the the few really engaging scenes was when Harrison Ford and Gary Oldman were on the screen together. I thought that was one of the few times the movie actually sort of was interesting, you know, playing off each other, two, you know, masters, really, in acting. Um, you know, you're exactly right, Justin, with the plot being everything we've seen before. It reminded me of Eagle Eye, which in itself wasn't, you know, a super terrific movie. Um, you know, and it reminded me of a few other movies in that vein. I did, I gave it a D plus. I thought it was uh, just slightly, slightly better, I think, than you did. Um, but I, you know, I, I can't say too many great things about it. It wasn't that engaging. It wasn't that thrilling. I thought the plot was mildly interesting. Um, you know, again, the acting by Harrison Ford was great, uh, but it really, it brought nothing new to the table. So, uh, let's move on from there. A uh, movie we all saw, and Justin, you just saw today, uh, was The Conjuring. So let's talk about that. Joe, uh, since since you've been left out here the last couple movies, do you want to talk about The Conjuring? Uh, <clears throat> the Conjuring. Uh, you know, I have, going into this film, I was actually really, uh, really interested because I was getting a lot of feedback and a, a lot of ideas from people about how this film was one of the like best horror movies they'd seen in a long time. It changed the game. It was just getting all these really great reviews. So I was, you know, having my expectations fairly high when I went in. On the whole, I feel like it was a fairly safe, generic horror movie, but it was done fairly well. And I think the fact that it explored its characters in a fairly roundabout, dynamic way uh, made them more interesting than the general characters you find in most horror movies about exorcisms and the like. I thought that made it a little more separate, but it's not the A or A plus I was expecting. I actually gave it a B plus personally, but I did enjoy it. the acting was stellar, and it had some genuinely creepy moments, but... It also kind of had some rather cheesy and laughable ones for me, so it was a very interesting experience. All right, still a pretty good review. Still a good review, Justin. I really like the director with this one, uh, James Wan. I think he's nobody we're going to really write home about, but he's very good at working at making big things happen very cheaply, and that's really something to go down with. It's really hard, if not impossible, to bring something new to the table with horror at this point just because we've seen so much in so many varieties. But he takes something that we've all seen and recognized before and does something really impressive with it. He created a really well-crafted, well-constructed horror movie. I'm not going to say it's completely terrifying, but there are some moments where it is really creepy. I will confess I did jump a couple times. Yes, it is. It could come off a little safe because we have seen it before, but I think it did all right. I I left really satisfied with this one. I'm giving it a B. Nice. Um, I thought it was one of the best horror movies in a while. Um, it's doing bang up business at the box office. It's number ten uh, for the summer releases, which I think everybody was kind of blown away by, and. I think with good reason. I mean, it's it's got a strong word of mouth. I mean, just to sort of uh, key off of what Joe was saying about the the acting and the character development and stuff. I thought it was it was really cool. Um, it it's based sort of off a, a true story. Um, you know, the, this couple really does you know do all this uh, ghost hunting. Vera Farmiga or Farmiga, I'm not sure how you pronounce it, um, is up and coming one of my favorite actresses uh, she's been in she really knocks it out of the park she knocks it out of the park in everything i everything she's been in pretty much for me has gotten a high grade uh, up in the air was one of my favorite films that that was released um she's obviously getting some fame right now on television with the bates motel which i think is it's about time for her 
because uh, she's she's great in this movie as she's great in everything. She does have some talent. She does. She has a lot of talent, yes. And for me, The Conjuring was very scary. It wasn't really scary for the first, let's say, hour. It was more of the character development and, you know, a little jumps here and there. But uh, mm -hmm. the, the final maybe 20 minutes or so uh, of The Conjuring had me really scared out of my wits. I was crying. And uh, I cry at a lot of movies, <laughs> but I don't usually cry out of fear uh, from horror movies. I've cried at maybe a couple other ones. I think Paranormal Activity 3 was one of them. Um, but, I mean, this one really... I mean, you talk about edge of your seat. I thought the end was very, very well done. Uh, and by the end, I mean really the last like 20, 25 minutes of the film. So I, I thought it was great. Um, I gave it an A, one of the few A's I've actually given out this year. Not not a terrific year so far for movies, but uh, oh no, <laughs> I thought I thought Conjuring was uh, was really a good, solid horror movie. Moving on, we have uh, Two Guns, which Justin uh, saw. Was that yesterday? Yeah, it was actually. And, uh, all three of us have seen that, right? Did you see Two Guns, Joe? I have Joe? not seen it in its entirety, no. Okay. Well, we'll talk a little bit about that. Then we won't be too long-winded. I really liked it. Um, I think, you know, I, I say Justin uh, tends to be hard on comedies. I think action is probably the genre that I'm the most hard on. Especially this year, we have had a lot of bad offerings from Good Day to Die Hard to Bullet to the Head, Parker... Uh, the beginning of the year was not kind of action, but I think we've gotten uh, a few in the summer here that are not bad. I thought Two Guns really towed the line well between action and comedy. Denzel was was great, uh, a little bit not out of his element because he has done similar things before. I mean, Safe House was was very actiony. But to combine the, the comedy and the action, I thought it was very well done. Mark Wahlberg, I am a fan of. I don't think he always picks the best projects. Um, but I thought the two were very well matched. It's really, it's it's sort of almost the buddy cop comedy that uh, I, I wish the heat was. Mm. The heat was funnier, but the, the action, you know, and, and just there wasn't really anything original about the heat. Um, I thought this was uh, a lot more well done. I gave it a B plus. Justin, I actually completely agree with you on in terms of it. Uh, it being what I w really wish the heat was. Uh, however, I think the main selling point for this for me was the unexpected, really good chemistry between Wahlberg and Denzel Washington. Denzel does a great job as a, as the uh, straight man, and. Almost 90% of the time, Mark Wahlberg knocks it out of the park, which I was completely floored by because most of the time, I am usually underwhelmed by the man, and I left really, really content with what he did in this movie. Uh, the storyline, it comes and goes. Some of it's interesting, some of it not so much, but one of the best things going forward is the chemistry, and the humor is right on the money, and... I was completely surprised at how much I really did like this movie. I'm giving it a B. Okay, very good. Um, and I think last but not least, but you guys will tell me if I'm wrong, um, Percy Jackson. Joe, I believe you saw that two nights ago or something? Uh, I saw it, I think, the Sunday of the first weekend with my girlfriend, I think. Okay, so about about a week ago for you. Yeah, it, it sunk in a bit for me. Um, and we're talking about the second Percy Jackson movie, Sea of Monsters. D did you see the first one, Joe? No, I did not. But from what I've heard, I didn't miss much. Okay. Yeah, I thought I thought the first one was okay. I don't know anything about um, the character from the book series, which is uh, incredibly popular apparently. But I saw the movie and I sort of thought, okay, it's Harry Potter light. I believe I gave the first one a B minus. We watched it again the other night before going to the the second one, and you know I, I think my B minus holds. This one was worse. I didn't really find the um, the action that engaging. You know Stanley Tucci, I love, but he really needs to branch out a little bit from that character. It was essentially you know a similar character to what he played in Jack the Giant Slayer earlier this year. And I just, I didn't, it didn't really come together 
at all for me. I mean, it was, you know, it's rated PG, so obviously they're not going to be uh, super violent or anything like that. I think, you know, for a kid's movie, if it's, you know, maybe one of the first action movies a kid has seen, they would think, oh, okay, this is pretty good. I think in that respect, it, it hit its mark, and that's why I'm giving it a C-. minus. Um, for me, personally, I, I didn't really like it all that much. I would have probably given it a D plus for me personally, but I do factor in sort of um, how it plays to its intended audience. And I think kids, you know, that aren't used to seeing action movies wouldn't be so nonplussed by the cliches and uh, the other kind of negatives I found with it. Joe, what did you think? Uh, on the whole, I mean, in terms of an adaption, I don't really know a lot about Percy Jackson, but from the film's format, you can tell it probably didn't follow things too closely. You can just tell, even if you're not familiar, there's just something about it that makes it obvious. Uh, it does have kind of that, that fun, cheesy element that I think Dan described. I think you could see it as an enjoyable film to some degree if you take it lightly. Uh, there were definitely a lot of dumb moments, a lot of clumsy moments. I mean, Harry Potter Light's a good way to describe it. I thought some of the acting was decent. I thought some of the characters were okay. Others, I thought, were not um, in either respect. So I feel like it was kind of a mess, and I felt like the third act was completely terrible. It just any suspense or interest I had was completely lost by the end. I thought there was all, some potential that just was not tapped into. But on the whole, I'd say it was a little less than okay. I gave it a C- minus as well. Well, to join the rest of my... Uh... My party here. I also do not know much about Percy Jackson, uh, so therefore I really don't know how much it translates to the in comparison to the book based on everything I've read. Not particularly well. Uh, with the first one, I I admit it had flaws, but it still felt like we can that they can learn from this, that they can build on it in future sequels. This was not said sequel. Um, it felt very forced in spots. It really didn't come together. The storyline just seemed to go from, like, one episode to the next. As I was telling Dan earlier, it literally felt at points that they took whatever budget they could have had for the sequel and just slashed it. And it it shocked me when he told me that it was on par with the original of $90 million, And it really does not show at all. The CGI is... <laughs> Quite possibly the worst I have seen all year. <laughs> yeah, the CGI was bad. <laughs> I, I didn't mention that either. The CGI was pretty badly integrated. I will say this, though. Some of the minor characters, notably Nathan Fillion as Hermes, were surprisingly good, and, they, mm. and they're actually captivating. The problem is Nathan Fillion is only on screen for about five minutes. <laughs> but honestly, the only reason this is not getting an F from me comes from the fact that if you can take it from a kid's perspective, it might be enjoyable. So I'm going to leave it with a D. And Nathan Fillion, you're right, uh, adds yeah. really the only humor I thought in pretty much the whole movie. Uh, I had something to cap this off that I just think really describes it in just one sentence. I mean, for anybody that's familiar with Greek mythology at all, if a minotaur is more threatening than Kronos, you're doing something wrong. <laughs> There's a problem. All right, uh, we're going to wrap up uh, the the new movie section here. I did see Kick-Ass 2, but you guys have not yet, so we'll save that for uh, for our next podcast. Um, so let's jump into the top ten. Like we talked about at the beginning of the show here, you know, each week there's going to be a different theme, top ten or top five. And uh, Justin actually came up with this one. I think because it's our first uh, show, I thought it would be really, really cool to, uh, to do this on our first show, sort of as a get to know us a little bit, and not just our taste in movies, because we've, we've already talked about that for a while, but just to know us as people and sort of how we relate to the movies. So Justin, why don't you uh, reiterate the theme that uh, we heard from Joe earlier? Our top ten is for this week is going to be movies that in some way reflect our lives. There's a lot of uh, wiggle room with that, I think, too. I, I, I'm interested to hear how we each sort of interpreted that. And, Justin, since it was your idea, why don't we start with you? We're going to uh, do number 10 and uh, go down. We'll sort of – you give your number 10, and then we will uh, each give our number 10, so on and so forth. Well, for my first three, it deals much more with the overall themes of the films rather than the actual uh, film itself. For number 10, I chose uh, Harvey. And the main reason I chose that is, for a long time, I obviously never fit in as a kid. And Harvey really is all about 
being okay with being weird and and having fun with it and overall just having people come to accept that and for me it was both a blessing and a curse growing up because yes i was different but i learned to channel that difference to become a better person for it i have actually not seen harvey neither have i so that may be one uh that you want to bring to old classics tuesday because i i would love to see that joe what about you all right this should uh <laughs> this is an interesting way to introduce this uh the first movie i have my number 10 is comic book villains it's a movie you guys probably haven't seen. I think it came out in like 2002. Kind of a dark comedy. And the plot is basically about this guy who... He runs a comic book store. And he finds uh, out about this man that died. Who apparently had a massive collection. And he and a couple of guys basically... Uh, comic book fanatics basically fight each other to the death over it. It's kind of a weird thriller. Um, I basically picked that because it sort of emulated my, my love for comic books growing up. And just kind of also some people that I sort of know and kind of taking something I like to a much darker area <laughs> that I just don't think is explored too much so I thought that was kind of funny but all, the humor is very me definitely I yeah I've not even heard of that movie yeah, it's it it's got its issues but it, it does strike a chord very interesting my number 10 is uh, sort of actually keying off of what Justin said about his childhood my number 10 is Where the Wild Things Are. Ooh, good choice. Um, I had a very, very rich inner life as a child. Um, I mean, I had a big family, and, and you know, so I had brothers and stuff to, to play with, but I also had a lot of, not imaginary friends, so to speak, but, you know, I always wanted to uh, to work in radio ever since I was about nine years old, and so I would sort of imitate the the DJs on the radio and sort of make up my own different radio shows and all that kind of stuff and um so where the wild things are really spoke to me in terms of um just imagination and that kind of thing all right Justin all right so for number nine this is also a reflection of uh just the overall themes I chose Blade Runner and the reason I chose that is a central theme of Blade Runner has to do with humanity as I mentioned before, I really did not fit in as a kid, and I never really did. And it made me really wonder, what does it really mean to be human, to act human? And one of the main things I really love about Blade Runner is the villains are arguably the most human element of the entire film, and it really makes you think about that. Wow. Nice. Uh, my number nine is a film I'm sure you have both seen. It is uh, Clerks. Uh, Clerks Very is... Nice. <laughs> very, very simply, much like comic book villains, though I think much closer to my life, particularly my young adult life, the types of type of jobs I've had, the type of people I've worked with, sort of experiences, it very much emulates that. And uh, I guess Kevin Smith being kind of the the jaded pop culture, you know, spewing nerd that he is, <laughs> kind of reflects just my overall attitude, my experiences, and just the conversations that those characters have in those movies. I've had those conversations. That's just some way to pass the time when you, you're in a job you hate. You're having the most random conversation, pseudo-intellectual, uber-nerdy thing you can. It's just very, very similar. I, I reflect very well with uh, those two main characters, I think. Uh, my number nine is 16 Candles. <laughs> uh, I had to, to put a John Hughes movie on here. I think everybody can relate to one of John Hughes's characters, whether it's from The Breakfast Club, whether it's Ferris Bueller. For me, there's a few different things in 16 Candles I related to, um, least of which is not uh, that my parents actually did forget my birthday one year when I was in high school, so I was probably about that age. Um, and also her little brother uh, in the film was sort of, I related to him too, just because he was a wise guy and he always had a smart comment, quick on his feet with a, with a burn on somebody. Um, and so I sort of related to that as well. Justin? All right, so number eight for me uh, is probably one of the most important movies from my childhood because it really gave me a work mantra that I honestly still use to this day, uh, James and the Giant Peach. And you might be wondering why that is. <laughs> you, wouldn't, you are not mistaken. <laughs> uh, there's a good story there. Uh, when I saw it, a big moral of the story is looking at things from a different angle we constantly are looking at our struggles in life and taking it in a simple one variation on it but the more i thought about that and the more my parents sort of hit it home for me the more i really took that to heart and really got to respect this movie and 
I honestly could not, I could not put that movie on my list without that emphasizing that moral. So that's how that one reflects my life for my uh, bottom three at the moment. All right, uh, cool, cool choice. Um, number eight, a movie that I don't watch very often. I think I've only seen it once or twice, but I can't deny that it was a powerful experience because it did reflect my life. Uh, Kramer versus Kramer. Coming from a divorced family, I thought the uh, torture of the two separate parties going through uh, some way of trying to share their, their son's life, their, their child's life, but trying to find that balance is something that I, I really, really definitely understood. It's not an easy thing. Divorce can often be painful, and the child often doesn't understand. And it's something that they often carry with them for the rest of their lives. And just the performances in the movie was great. The direction was great. It's an excellent film, and I think it really touches upon that subject in a way few films really do. So, yeah, Kramer versus Kramer, number eight. Cool. Thank you. That's, that's a good choice. My number eight is I Love You, Man. Um, which may not seem like uh, anybody's life story, but very few characters, adult characters, I should say, um, I, I've seen myself in as much as Jason Siegel's uh, Sidney Fife character in that movie. He is basically, for lack of a better term, a man-child. Um, he loves to have fun. He is also serious when he needs to be, but, you know, he's he's always, you know, trying to... Um, to get Paul Rudd's character to have more fun and be more free with himself and uh, and that sort of thing. So that was that's my number eight. All right, so number seven for me is uh, one that truly hits home for <laughs> for my uh, own personal love life reasons. And I'm sure Dan is going to start rolling his eyes as soon as he hears this. Before Sunrise. <laughs> uh, yep, that's an eye roll. All yeah, right. he, you'll have to forgive. Needless to say, uh, Before Midnight came out earlier this year, and I've been obsessing over the latest installment for the past several months. So I, I apologize to Dan in advance for that. <laughs> um, the main reason being, I um, met a girl online about six years ago, and we've been on again, off again. But then she's since moved here, and she's doing very well. But I think that represents a lot of my uh, ambitions and close relationship with her pretty accurately i roll aside i can totally see it mm. that's that's a good choice uh number seven right yep um number seven is gonna kind of follow along with a theme that some of these other movies i list uh, in this list will kind of coincide with basically movies where i really identify with the main character and their struggle and i could have picked a couple films for this uh but the one i think that best uh, emphasized it was the graduate I think being someone, even before I uh, got out of college, I think when I was in high school, I felt like this, just kind of trying to find yourself, uh, that struggle of just going through that, that post-college depression. It's something that a lot of people go through, and I thought it was very relatable, not to mention the fact that the film was really well done. I just uh, thought it's a, it's a timeless masterpiece, and I love The Graduate, and I love the main character, and I think it's just excellent. I love it. Would you believe that's one I have not seen? <laughs> All right, uh, Dan's gonna have to get on that. Yeah, I, I do. I have a lot of gaps in uh, my older movie watching uh, wow. repertoire. Uh, all right, my number seven is also sort of like I Love You, Man, and that it's an odd choice that you don't really think about when you think movies that mirror my life. It is Super Eight, and aside <laughs> from the sci-fi elements of it, me and my friends grew up in the '80s and early '90s. And we were all about uh, the video cameras and making our own shows. And at one point, we tried to write a movie. And so just I, I thought that it was very well done in the way that the kids related to each other and the way that the kids related to their art. And I really I felt, you know, a connection with that with my own childhood. All right. So number six is a recent movie. I was originally really nervous about putting this on here, but I thought it fit my life so well. Seven Psychopaths. Um, now, before you <laughs> start calling the men in the uh, white coats and throwing me the funny farm, you have to take into consideration uh, a big hobby of mine is screenwriting. I love it. I love creating things. And I am constantly surrounding my people that are such a constant source of inspiration. They get me where I got to go, and I love them so much for it. <laughs> much like these guys. So. <laughs> yeah. Very cool you. choice. Nice, yeah. nice. Okay. Uh, mine, I believe, is... I think it's considered to be an excellent film by most critics, but I don't hear anybody ever talk about it. Once again, kind of emulating uh, uh, the teenage lifestyle and also going through counseling and therapy. Uh, ordinary People. 
Uh, I actually had never heard of this film before. It, it just kind of was um, actually, I think, shown to me in class, uh, in college when I attended community college. I was just blown away by it, and I really thought that, uh, once again, the main character's struggle, uh, trying to find himself, going through some uh, rocky romances and relationships with his parents, uh, just that kind of family life I can understand from that particular perspective. But uh, that's another one. Hits home for me. Uh, my number six is sort of along the lines of uh, Justin's Seven Psychopaths. Mine is a movie that probably would uh, paint me in the least flattering light of all of these. It's Young Adult. Charlize Theron plays uh, Mavis Gary, a struggling, uh, well, not struggling writer, but a writer whose uh, book series is has been canceled. So she uh, returns to her hometown to which her high school boyfriend has uh, recently had a baby and got married and she tries to get him back. She's honestly not an extremely likable character, which is why I was a little hesitant to even put this on the list, but her mindset and some of the things she does, uh, I can I can totally see me doing if I was in the same position. Justin? All right, so number five for me is another one that has to do with my uh, screenwriting obsession, adaptation. For anybody who's ever written a script, this is pretty spot on, especially when it comes to writer's block. I wouldn't say it's the funniest movie I've ever seen, but it is very realistic, almost painfully so, especially with uh, <laughs> Nicolas Cage's comical alter ego in it. But uh, overall, I, I was really, really impressed with it, and I thought it really reflected how one chooses to go about the writing process with trying to put together an adaptation, which, ironically, my very first script was. Hmm. Well, let's see. This is kind of one that I sort of selected from three films that I think are excellent that came out the same year. The other two being Office Space and Fight Club. This one, I think, just comes from uh, a lot of my time thinking about various problems in uh, society, views of the American lifestyle, uh, more philosophical, religious, and just a variety of different thoughts. And also the way this film was shot, uh, the way it was directed, and also the main character, once again, is someone that even though I can't exactly relate to a situation, I really felt myself really connecting to him. And uh, that would be American Beauty. I just think it's a, a really great film. And uh, I just, it really emulates how I think about various things and how I think I see the world. And also some of the humor and, and lines of the film, I think are just very me as well. If I was a jaded, cynical older man, I think. <laughs> but that's just a, a prognosis for the future. I'm not sure. <laughs> My number five really needs no introduction because it's already been on someone else's list. It is Clerks. Yeah. Um, I've worked uh, many, many jobs, and most of them have been, most of the part-time ones anyway, have been in customer service, retail, fast food. You know, I think anybody that has had those types of jobs can relate to jerky customers or... Um, you know, obviously there's a lot of good customers, but boy, when you get a bad one, it can ruin your whole day. And I just, you want to use these, um, comeback lines that, <laughs> that Randall uses. And so yeah, clerks, Kevin Smith really hit the nail on the head with that one. I would, I would agree with Joe on that. Justin. All right. So my number four, much in the same creative spotlight is uh, big fish. Now there seems to be one of two extremes. Loves the movie or despises it with Red Hot Fire Passion. I personally enjoyed it, and I really think it's a great celebration of just storytelling in its oldest, most traditional form, and that's what I really love about it. Storytelling is universal, be it theater, be it oral traditions, be it, be it in cinema, like we're talking about right now. It's just a matter of telling a great story and sharing it with everyone you know, which is something I really strive to do in life. I don't think I know people that don't like Big Fish. I never heard that either. And and if if you're out there, please don't let us know because that will make me think much less of you. I've actually never heard it a is negative a fantastic I, movie. I, I've never heard a negative thing <laughs> yeah. said about that one. I, I, I think it's I, so good natured and yeah. simplistic. How could you hate it? I don't know. Wow. I don't know who does not like that movie. Hey, if you don't if you don't like it, leave a comment or something. Yeah. And we'll conversate about. It. I don't know. That's, <laughs> let me share that perspective. Yeah, Joe, what's your number four? Well, in that vein of storytelling. Um, Number four for me is Scott Pilgrim vs. The World. Nice. Um, I didn't think this would be it, but just the mishmash of things that I like. I mean, whether it's comic books, anime, video games, 
just pop culture, you know, the geeky guy trying to get the girl. I mean, it's just a situation I think that a lot of people can really relate to, and it's just a mishmash of all these different things in this unique fantasy world that a lot of people, I think, go into themselves. And I think it was a good way of expressing that. And uh, I really connected to that film, and it's very much me in a lot of ways. Uh, my number four is uh, another character-specific driven choice, um, and it is the movie Bridesmaids, which I not only love as a film, but Kristen Wiig's character Annie really, uh, you know, I've, I've never specifically been in some of her situations, but as a character, I would make every choice that she makes. She speaks in the same sort of manner that I do. You know, her, her lifelong friend and her are, are very close, and I have, uh, you know, a lot of friends I feel that way with. So I just, I really related to her character in that movie. Justin? Number three is quite possibly one of my favorite movies of all time, Cinema Paradiso. And the reason that is, is simply, it's a celebration of everything that is fantastic about the movies. Being in a room filled with people sharing a truly fantastic experience. And having that experience for the rest of your life, which is something I truly, truly, truly hope is the rest of my days. Very nice. My number three, also one that I was uh, surprised I kind of got on the list, but it's a film that I've had a lot of enjoyment for over the years. It's been with me since childhood, um, and that is the movie Hero with Dustin Hoffman. I like this film because, kind of like uh, Justin expressed with James and the Giant Peach, it's about not looking at things from a single perspective. And you take a character who someone might see from some perspective as just being kind of someone who's just really despicable and seeing something truly great in them. I think that's just uh, wonderful seeing that view of how complicated life can be from certain people's perspectives. And the the storyline involving the son and the father is heavily reflected upon my own experiences with my father. So I think that's one reason why it speaks to me. That's, that is a great underrated movie, by the way. Uh, that's kind of if, how I would put it. <laughs> if you have not seen Hero, uh, do yourself a favor and, and rent it or or whatever. Uh, download it. it. It really is a great movie. No one talks about it. And nobody talks about it, so I'm, I'm glad that you did. My number three uh, comes from my high school days. It is Mean Girls. <laughs> um, and while I didn't specifically have problems with mean girls uh, in, in my high school. I did come out as gay in high school and uh, the character Damien in Mean Girls and his best friend Janice, I mean that was my entire high school experience. We were sort of, you know, the, the outcast, you know, sort of goofing on everybody but not caring, you know, if we were in the in crowd or not. So that dynamic between the two of them reflected my high school. All right, number two for me, and I'm hoping Dan does not freak out of me for this, is another recent movie, The Perks of Being a Wallflower. Wow, great choice. <laughs> uh, the main reason being, there's a lot I see reflected in the main character through myself. I feel his pain, I feel the laughs, and I think a lot of it comes from just simply having a great group of friends that get you where you got to go in life, and I think that is truly what makes it so important and powerful for me. All right. Uh, before I say this, I have to ask you guys a question because I have one on reserve here. Okay. Do television movies count? I would say yes. Was it a miniseries, though, or a movie? It was a one-episode showing. Then, yep, that counts. Uh, the Five People You Meet in Heaven. Oh. Interesting choice. I uh, never saw the movie, but the book is fantastic. Now, ironically, I'm probably one of the few people that hasn't read the book. I only saw the television movie with John Voight. I don't know. I think that I'm not a particularly religious or spiritual person, but I think that if I had a, a life journey of like going through my life and looking back on it and not seeing it as something that I was completely happy with and kind of wishing I'd gone one direction or another, like a lot of people go through in their lives, there's just a lot of mystery to it. I really feel like it's just a great way to reflect upon it, and I think it has a, a lot of power to it. And I just think it really spoke to me. I, I really think that's uh, something I just could relate to, honestly. Very cool. Yeah, the, the book was very powerful, so I'm not surprised. Um, my number two is The Perks of Being a Wallflower. <laughs> um, I think Justin probably saw that coming. It is one of my all-time favorite books, and it is one of my favorite movies of the last 
five years or so. I can't really add much more to it than uh, what Justin already said. The whole high school experience is embodied in that film better than probably anything I've ever seen. And, and it certainly reflected, you know, what I experienced. All right, so now we're up to The Big Kahuna. What is your number one, Justin? My number one is Barry Levinson's Diner. Now, that might not sound like, it, for me, who's always been a film geek ever since he was a child, but you can see yourself in the ensemble cast, and they always are about their adventures, both in and outside the diner, which, for me, reflects sort of my habits of going to the movies. I always, I always have a firm belief that to know me is to watch movies with me. And... In a lot of ways, that's how Diner works, and I had to make it my number one for that reason. <laughs> Very cool. Hmm. Another one I've never seen. I, I haven't seen probably uh, six or seven on your on your list, Justin. I'm yeah, intrigued. I haven't seen a few either. Yeah, uh, Joe, what's your number one? I don't know if you guys are gonna <laughs> you guys are gonna feel about this. My number one is Kick Ass. Now, hear me out. The character and how he lived his life before things got incredibly ridiculous in the film, I think, is very much me. His friends in high school, his life, it, it's very, very much me. And more importantly, I think that the rest of the film, uh, a guy actually becoming a superhero, living out his fantasies, that's what I did in my head all the time throughout high school. It's what got me through high school. Kick-Ass is me on a different level, I guess you could say. The imaginative side of me, which I believe is the best part of me. What's always going on in my head yeah, is pretty much Kick-Ass. So. I can totally see that. that I wouldn't have thought of that choice but that i can totally see it knowing you that's really cool um all right well my number one is uh the john cusack movie high fidelity which when it came out i hadn't seen it probably for about a year i saw it for the first time on dvd and it was one of these movies where like all of my friends that had seen it were like oh you have to see this movie this guy is you and i think there's there's quite a few things um in his character rob that really spoke to me. I mean, the most obvious is how he constantly ranks everything in his top fives. You know, he, he uh, owns a record store, which is something that I always wanted to do also. But aside from that, at the record store, every day they have, what's your top five? And, you know, like we talked about, this podcast is going to have stuff to rank every single week. And uh, is that's just, I love to rank things, my favorites, my my least favorites solidly a music and record collector loves making mixtapes um just all that kind of stuff uh really really spoke to me and and my friends all picked up on that so that had to be my number one so that's the top 10 great top 10 guys good job i'll say yeah i think that was uh quite an introspective look into uh you know each one of us all right so like we uh, explained at the top of the show sort of the initial thought that led us to making this podcast was uh, these Sunday night movie parties at me and Justin's house, and we call them New Classic Sundays. We watch a movie from the last two years that Justin and I both regarded uh, pretty high. I have to give it a B, and Justin has to give it a B minus um, because he has no A plus, so it sort of balances out that way. And Joe has seen so far about half of them previously. Uh, to New Classic Sunday. We've introduced him to a few real gems. And then Tuesdays, we are going to start doing uh, Old Classic Tuesdays, which is uh, we're going to draw a name every week, and that person that's selected gets to pick that uh, or the following week's movie. And it's a movie that we have seen and really enjoy and want to introduce uh, the rest of the group to. And then Thursdays, we're going to do Oscar nominee Thursdays, which is going to be an 18 to 20 year uh, proposition probably. So who knows if we'll even get to the end, but we're going to start alphabetically and go through the list of every major category nomination, uh, which includes all the acting, best picture, obviously, best director, best screenplay, best story, um, all that kind of stuff. And so we're going to start those this week. But since I figured we'd be uh, sort of wrapped up in our top ten this week, we uh, just did the Sunday movie, which is one of my favorites of the year. I've given two movies A-pluses this year, and this is one of them. It's the movie called Mud, 
And so we watched that on Sunday. Joe had not seen it previously. So I, I would love to hear first from you, Joe. What, what did you think of Mud? I really, really enjoyed it for the most part. I thought it was an excellent film. I definitely see where the praise comes from. I thought Matthew Kane gave, a, once again, a great performance, as he usually does. I liked the main characters who were actually children. The kid actors did rather excellent jobs. I'm sorry, do you want to give a brief synopsis of this movie? Just because it wasn't really widely covered. Uh, it wasn't covered. really widely covered? No, I mean, uh, you know, some theaters got it, but I think a lot of people might not even know what it's about. Uh, it basically takes... Where does the film take place, Dan? I, uh, in Arkansas. Arkansas. It takes yep. place in Arkansas. Mm-hmm. And uh, basically it follows these two young children and kind of in solace as kids do they go off into this little island it's in this big lake and on the island they find a boat that got washed up in a tree probably from a flood and they kind of make it their clubhouse they go hang out and they want to kind of discover it's like the little mystery find out why it got there and in addition to that they find this mysterious man named Mud who's played by Matthew McConaughey who basically says to them you know you help me out here as I'm hiding give me some food and whatnot. you can have the boat when it's done because he's essentially living there and so it basically deals with their interactions with him, trying to keep him and the boat a secret from everyone else, as it turns out. Matthew McConaughey is a man on the run. There you go. Good synopsis. Uh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so you enjoyed the film? Uh, I really enjoyed it. Uh, I thought it was excellent. And I mean, I'll let you guys say your piece before we go into the themes and different specifics I liked about the film. Would you like to hear my grade on it? I would love to. Uh, on the whole, I think that it was pretty darn solid. It was really excellent. I do think it kind of made some interesting choices. Didn't quite agree with. I gave it an A minus. Still good. Still very good. Yeah, Justin. I'm actually going to side with him on that A minus. Unlike him, I am not a really big Matthew McConaughey fan. I think he's very hit or miss. Most of the time, miss. But he does a really good job here, and it really comes together with the two main actors, who, as far as I'm aware, are no names, and. It just is a really well put together story along with a director that really brings it together. For anyone who has not seen this, go out and rent it because it's probably the most criminally underrated thing that's come out this year. My only real gripe with this movie, and it is a very, very small gripe, is that the third act, I won't give spoilers here, makes something bigger than it needs to be. And it would have benefited a lot more from, I'm not going to say subtlety, but more small scale. And I think most people will understand what I'm getting at if they end up watching it. Overall, for me, it was an A-. It's an incredibly solid movie and very well put together. But it does have some small problems around the third act. Dan, I'll let you take it from here. Yeah, I am with you in the uh, no love for McConaughey camp. Up until about two years ago, I was very anti-McConaughey. Um, You know, he had an amusing turn in Dazed and Confused 20 years ago, and since then it's been a lot of romantic comedy nonsense. Now, I didn't see A Time to Kill, which I understand is very good. (laughs) He's very good at playing lawyers. Yeah, that's his specialty, it seems. We discussed that, uh, you know, after we were watching the movie the other night, that, that A Time to Kill is apparently very good. That came out at a time when, you know, I was in college. We didn't have a local movie theater. I didn't see a lot of movies in that time period. So that was really before my hatred started, but I still just never got around to seeing it because then my hatred started. (laughs) I mean, you know, you look at Failure to Launch or any of the Kate Hudson movies, and she's not one of my favorites either. But, (laughs) um, I mean, How to Lose a Guy in 10 Days is okay that's about the best i can say for matthew mcconaughey before two years ago but then speaking of him enjoying uh playing the lawyer role i saw the lincoln lawyer and it was really good i don't have both of you seen that oh yeah yeah okay yeah very very good movie um and then last year he was also in a movie called bernie in which he played a lawyer um and that was also very good and he was good in it and then one of my absolute guilty pleasure movies magic mike which yeah. he was sort of playing up his his own um shtick. legend yeah his own shtick let's say you know he goes out on stage all right all right all right i mean he did it all and for me i was like okay this is one two three in a row now from mcconaughey that i I really am seeing a new side to him. Basically, he needs to break away from romantic comedies. Well, and I think I think what happened was, you know, he 
did those because he had bills to pay. And then once he uh, sort of made enough money, he was able to choose his projects wisely. And he seems to be doing just that. Mud is, without question, one of my favorite movies of the year. The, it's funny, the other movie I gave an A plus to is Silver Linings Playbook, which technically came out last year, but I didn't see it till January. So really, Mud is my favorite movie that's been released in 2013. Um, I think he's fantastic in it. I agree with Justin uh, that it was underrated, but not really, because I think it was just underseen. Critically, it did very well. Everyone I know that has seen it really, really liked it. 100% on Rotten Tomatoes, I believe. I, I believe it was 99. Something but like that. Super, super high rating on Rotten Tomatoes. Critically, it was a huge hit. Uh, you know, I think maybe it's a little too left of center, maybe, for mainstream audiences, or they just didn't know it existed, or whatever the case. It did all right in its uh, limited theatrical run. But Justin's absolutely right. Go rent the DVD. Um, but I thought McConaughey was great. Yeah, the kids are virtual unknowns. Ty Sheridan, who plays the lead, Ellis, you know, had a role in The Tree of Life, one of my least favorite movies. Um, <laughs> don't forget Reese. And, well, Reese Witherspoon is my favorite actress. I don't think she's necessarily the best actress out there. However, she's also choosing some really great roles lately. I think Mud is a good choice for her because it showed she wasn't in it a ton but she really was able to show her dramatic side a little bit more speaking of which i just remembered the movie i had told justin earlier that there was a movie i had thought of for my top 10 and i couldn't think of it anymore it's pleasantville starring reese witherspoon and um toby mcguire thank you <laughs> um which i you know i had considered that just for the loving TV and uh, wanting to grow up in the 50s and stuff. I just thought that would be cool. Good choice. But uh, anyway, didn't make the cut because I forgot. Um, <laughs> but Reese is great in mud. But yeah, the kids are really what makes this story shine. Ty Sheridan is absolutely phenomenal as Ellis. Um, he has a couple of really emotional scenes that are great, both with mud and with his uh, parents who are in process of getting a divorce. And just the realism with the dialogue between him and his friend Neckbone, it's just, it's so well written and well acted. Joe, what what can you add to that? Uh, I actually agree. I think that it really did an excellent job of really capturing something lifelike and very realistic. I mean, it's really capturing life. And I think the thing for me that I really took away most of this movie is, I, I guess the primary theme I saw was basically trying to maintain innocence in a harsh world. And that would basically be the transition from childhood to adulthood. And I thought that was basically characterized in the example of Ellis's parents, you know, being separated. And he was basically going through the struggle of trying to maintain what it means to have a romantic relationship with someone, in this case a girl. He goes through that struggle and it is kind of paralleled by Mud's story and his relationship with, with his love interest and Ellis trying to help Mud is kind of in a way him trying to save his parents' marriage in a different way. Absolutely. Yeah, couldn't agree more with that. Yeah, I mean, I think that is a major theme of the film. And Mud's on-again, off-again, volatile relationship with Reese Witherspoon's character, Juniper, really, Ellis wants so badly to see it work out because it didn't work out with his parents, because he's going through his own struggles with this girl who he wants to be with so badly um, in his own life. And yeah, I, I completely agree. I, mean, I would say that really it's just his way of trying to maintain hope because you know, he's not only, in addition to his parents being separated, he has to leave his home. He's seeing the world's just not a fair place. It doesn't always make sense. And we really see him trying to have this strong sense of right and wrong. He's a really strong kid, but he's still a kid. And there are just some things he doesn't quite understand. And I thought that was captured beautifully in this film. And he wants to believe. He wants to believe in something. Mm -hmm. And he chose love because, you know, that's universal, I think, for everybody. We hope. And, you know, especially for somebody in that stage of adolescence, you know, it's girls are all you think about. And for your home life to be crumbling around you, like you said, because his parents are getting divorced, you know, he ends up having to leave his home, too. 
and leave his job also because he works with his dad selling fish and you know they can't do that anymore because of the situation now there there is something justin brought up in a previous conversation that i'd like to go to but i'd like to hear from him first because he's been awfully quiet about yeah it. justin do tell please in terms of overall... Uh, uh, just anything, man. Yeah, anything. If you want to build off the relationships, if you want to talk well, about something else. Actually, I would like to hit off on that. I actually completely agree with Joe in terms of that being one of the main important themes of MUD. It's interesting because upon the viewings of MUD that I, I've witnessed, um, I actually thought it took a little bit of a uh, misogynistic take on love and things like that with uh, the women in the film seeming unfaithful or uh, cheating, or, or some variation between the two. But instead, it, it's much like you said, trying to maintain innocence when one isn't necessarily used to it. And I think that really felt real and, and relatable. And I think it really came together well. There's not much that you two have mentioned that I really could refute. That's the only real reason I I was... Uh, <laughs> I, I was piping I, down. <laughs> I, I was piping down. I, you, I've been talking a lot of this session, so I figured I'd let you two have a moment. <laughs> okay, uh, well, there was just one little idea that you brought up I thought was very interesting, which is kind of one reason I think we thought the movie sort of turned an odd direction, was, uh, okay, Matthew McConaughey's character, Mud is, in fact, a real person, and these events, this subplot, if you will, or the main plot, however you want to look at it, is, in fact, occurring, but I thought kind of in relation to the themes of being someone trying to maintain innocence, Ellis and uh, Neckbone kind of going to their island sort of reflected the concept of escape from a harsh reality and mud in fact could be the adventurer the make-believe friend and there is kind of an element of fantasy to him that really kind of i think is exemplified at certain points in the film but obviously the realism does come back and kind of hits you nailed in there i was kind of curious how you how you thought that was um demonstrated i actually thought he was he took sort of a uh, push and pull kind of character at the start of the film he's He's very manipulative. He's very much trying to pretty much get the kids to do whatever he wants for his own benefit. But at the end of the movie, he seems very human, more more trying to help help Ellis try and find himself, try and hold on to what he really is, his better nature of him, who he is as a person. He lives in a world where his parents' relationships aren't working. He has his, he has his friend, he's moving away, and he's not quite sure how to take that. And basically by the end of the film, again, not giving spoilers, Mud seems much more willing to make sure that he leaves with that impression so that he can continue that, even if he's going away for some time. You know, I actually agree with that. I think that uh, Mud's character does seem like kind of a selfish individual at first. He does seem kind of manipulative. But by the end of the film, I think he does realize how much of an impact he's having on these kids. And he grows to respect them and care about them as we see and actually goes to great lengths to make sure that they have some good direction to becoming decent men you know and i think that that's a very strong point actually well and and something very specific happens to him in the film i think that that helps him bridge that gap and helps him think a little more about what he's doing like you said you know being impactful on the kids lives and uh, there's a couple of times, certainly, like you say, towards the end of the film, but even, you know, sort of in the later half of the middle of the movie, where he really changes who he is. You know, at the beginning of the film, he really is not a bad person, but somebody with zero direction, somebody that doesn't care about anybody, I would say probably even including himself. And once he gets uh, a dose of reality let's say you know i think things change a little bit for him and he and he realizes these kids might be the only friends he has in the world i think that helps him come to the realization that he he does want to be a better person it's kind of a uh, counteractive with how mud kind of helps ellis retain the positive aspects of himself Ellis kind of helps Mud rediscover those positive aspects about himself. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, they kind of save each other in that union, I guess you could say. Yeah, that's a, that's a very interesting point. Well, we're uh, kind of running out of time here, but I think we all agree uh, Mud was a good choice for this week. Oh, excellent. Um, I'm, I'm glad that you enjoyed it, uh, Joe. I certainly love it. Again, you know, if you have not seen Mud, please go rent it. It is a fantastic movie. If there's any justice... 
I would say this would be uh, McConaughey's bid for a Best Actor nomination. I don't think it will happen, and I think that's a bit of a shame, but I guess you never know. I mean, we'll we'll see what happens come Oscar uh, season. I think the Oscars won't overlook it. I hope. Maybe screenplay, maybe McConaughey. It'll win something. Actor. It'll definitely have to win um, something. Yeah, I, I hope it at least gets nominated, at least gets recognized. Justin, final thoughts on Mud? Just go see it. That's really <laughs> it. If you haven't seen it, go see it. <laughs> there you go. I think as we speak, it's on Redbox. All right. Well, as we wrap up here, uh, first of all, I want to thank everybody for listening to the first Film Fanatics show. More to come. We'll be uh, recording them every Sunday night. Joe also uh, has a YouTube uh, channel that we mentioned briefly at the beginning of the show. We want to direct you all to there if you uh, liked his commentary and stuff and want to hear a little more in-depth uh, reviews of some of the newer movies out there. Joe, uh, what do they need to do for that? Just go into YouTube, uh, type in Merlin Boss. I'll come up there. Uh, you'll see my primary focus is film, but I also delve into comics and anime if you're into that sort of stuff. But um, we'll find a way to put a link in the description and vice versa on my YouTube channel. I'll put a link in, get Film Fanatics linked up here, and uh, we'll be good to go. Awesome. And uh, we do have a Twitter account that is up and running called, uh, it's at Film Fanatics Pod, P O D, short for podcast. Uh, so it's at Film Fanatics Pod. You can uh, leave comments, um, you know, suggestions for top tens, and uh, we'll hit you back. So again, thanks for listening, and uh, we'll see you next week. This has been Film Fanatics. <laughs>